You may observe that I'm tied up in wiring of various sorts. Apparently the authorities are deeply suspicious on what goes on in my lectures and are taking a coloured film and recording what I say in a transmitter here. <laughs> so this is not a hearing aid fitted in the wrong place. <laughs> well, gentlemen, and I'm going to proceed with expanding on what I said in my last lecture and continuing on the technique of inventiveness. I tried to explain that it was a partnership between your conscious and your subconscious. The subconscious did all the hard work and the conscious got all the credit. The subconscious handed up ideas and the conscious looked down its nose at it and decided whether it was a good idea or not. Now the situation is in actual fact slightly more complicated than that. For there is, or you can build, a filter between your subconscious and your conscious mind. A filter that blocks silly things coming through. And I want to talk the first half of my lecture about developing a filter that filters out bad designs and lets through good ones. In short, I'm going to talk about what I would call the artistry of design. Nothing to do with the artistic. A, an electrical insulator may look highly picturesque but be no good. A bridge may look nice but fall down. The artistry of engineering is a subtlety of style which is much more difficult to define. Like all styles in music or art of any sort, it's easier to recognize the thing itself than to put it down in a general definition. But if I had to give an example of style, I would steal it from a scientist who, talking of his own discipline, said, and this is Sir Arthur Eddington, we sometimes have convictions which we cherish but cannot justify. We are influenced by some innate sense of the fitness of things. Now the artistry of engineering is an innate sense of the fitness of things. And let me try and describe by a rather disreputable example what I mean. It is something that commends itself to you without necessarily a rational background. You just say immediately, instinctively, that's the way to do it. I was a director of a firm up in Scotland which made an immense amount of plastic floor covering. And many million pounds of it was stored in the warehouses there. And it was reported <coughs> in a long series of board meetings, quite a lot of it was being stolen. Now, we could not understand how anyone could steal plastic rolls of floor covering, two meters high, three quarters of a meter diameter, weighing an immense amount, with these huge, strong steel uh, doors, concrete floors. There was no sign of the doors being attacked, no signs of any exterior entry, no clues at all. The police couldn't discover a clue of any sort. How you got those things mysteriously out of a heavily guarded factory until someone in the middle of the night spotted it being done. And one of the warehousemen each night, before he went home, he pushed over one of these plastic rolls and rolled it around till it was next to the door there. 
He then proceeded to uncover the outside and stick under the door. <laughs> and came back in the middle of the night and just wound that up, you see, to a roll with this side and not that side. Now, why you laughed was, uh, there was a sense of the, of the right way of doing it. <laughs> the immediate impact was that if you're going to be a thief, this is a good style of thieving. <laughs> this disreputable toy is solely to produce that sort of sudden impact. That's a good idea, <laughs> even though it's a bad idea. Now, this sort of impact happens in engineering design as it is extremely valuable. And if you can develop it, it will censor out silly ideas at source. But there is a sense of paradox linked in with it. And that is this, that all new inventions are embodied to start with in out-of-date technology. Technology always trots along behind a new invention. And therefore, a new idea which is extremely good may look extremely repellent when first produced because the technology is clumsy, awkward and unsuitable. And a sense of style sometimes needs the ability to look through the unsuitable technology to the idea beneath it. Again an example. <clears throat> During, I regret to say, one of the lectures when I was here, a friend of mine whispered that he had just bought two aeroplanes. <laughs> I asked him why he had bought two. Did he want to fly both at once? And he said no. Actually, um, he had bought the first one and the folk were so pleased that he actually paid cash for it, they threw the second one in free of charge. <laughs> and would I like to go out in it that afternoon? <clears throat> so we duly went along and ob observed these two <clears throat> gypsy moth planes. They were largely made of piano wire, and most of the wire seemed to be only attached to something at one end. <laughs> he decided that we ought to go up in the one whose engine was most likely to start. I thought it'd be better to go up in the one where the engine was most likely to go on running and not stop. <laughs> However, we got one going and I crammed into a little open cockpit. He was in front of me and, and uh, I observed that there was only one instrument. Well, only one instrument that worked, actually. <laughs> there were two, really. Um, the, uh, the Orkney, the, uh, the height worked, but the airspeed didn't. And um, we trotted off across the grass and up we went in this terrifying device. And I asked him beforehand what happened if he got lost, well, he said the easiest thing to do is this, that all railway stations have their name on it, and they also have clocks on the platform, so you fly through a platform and have a look at the time and the name of the station, which he proceeded to do. <laughs> <laughs> Another interesting fringe benefit was this, that you could go off catching rabbits. This was most interesting because on the flat fields north of Cambridge, where we used to fly across the fields about three or four feet above the grass, hopping over the hedges, till we saw a rabbit and we ran after it and tried to put a wheel down on it. <laughs> Fortunately, we weren't very successful. But the point I'm making is this, that in that gypsy moth lay all the principles that a concord now embodies. There was nothing there that hadn't got all the excellences of a modern aircraft that 
embodies it in modern technology. The style was there, the technology wasn't. In fact, it was better in some ways because you can't really catch rabbits with concords. <laughs> now, this paradox, you'll have to try and recognize existing. That is that all new inventions that you see, if they are new inventions, will automatically have this clumsy technology hung round their necks. And you must try and differentiate the sense of style of the principle from the awful style of the bits and pieces of Meccano and string and everything else that embodies it. Now, the second thing about the sense of style is this. And here I must go back again to the, the emotional impetus that is behind practically all engineering enthusiasm. And that is this, that if you get hold of a new good idea, there is a terrible compulsion to do what I'd like to call over-design it. You're so tickled with your invention, you want to fl flog the idea to a ridiculous extreme spoil it by over-designing it, by exaggerating it, by thinking about nothing else but your wonderful idea and, and that is all that ever enters your mind. Now I've often done this. When I was a student, um, as you probably gathered, I made various racing cars of queer designs. And uh, after the one that I talked about some lectures ago, I thought I would like to make a car that would go in for sprint hill climbs, which meant going round corners fast. And I studied, or tried to study in a fairly elementary way, the best way to make a racing car, a highly diagrammatic drawing, go quickly round a series of corners. Now, all the orthodox cars in those days, minis were never heard of, were all rear-wheel drive. Roughly like that. Now, if you start taking that car around the corner fast, what you do is, naturally, is to angle the front wheels like this, and round it starts to go and on the center of gravity here there's a force out here which has to be counteracted by the reaction against the road. Now the difficulty about a rear wheel drive car is this that when you turn the power on you have a force like that and a resultant in that direction and therefore the sideways force here is reduced and the back of the car starts to swing round which immediately makes the front wheels swing round and the car starts to spin it's trying constantly to go round a sharper and sharper corner it's in a totally unstable equilibrium and if you aren't careful uh, not quick enough correcting a skid, off the road you go spinning like a top. This I frequently did. And so I thought it would be a good idea uh, to introduce what in those days had never been done before, I think, in a racing car. And that was this, that I would drive off the front wheels. Now the advantage was of that would be is that if we started to go too fast compared with the driving power and the cornering force all would happen would be that the whole thing would slide off in that direction it would make the corner more gradual it would be self-correcting in that instead of making the corner constantly sharper by doing this it would smooth the corner off by doing that and provided you didn't hit anything hard there, it was a much more stable way of dealing with things. Right, well that was the style that I thought was good. And by and large it was reasonable. What was unreasonable 
was the way I embodied it, because I was so pleased with myself, I could think of nothing else. And the way I embodied that particular principle really is a horror comic of the worst sort. And I said to myself, I want plenty of weight on the front wheels because they mustn't spin. And therefore, I must put every possible heavy component in the front of the car. Sorry about the drawing, but I didn't want to waste time being more elaborate. The first thing I moved, I put the petrol tank in the front. <laughs> Wasn't that the wisest place to put it? I moved the engine and the transmission up as far as I could over the front wheels. And I reckon that I got all the weight I could over the front end. And I thought it might help if I put two tyres on the front wheels, which I did. <laughs> Remarkable sight, really. <laughs> but it didn't stop there. I mean, it was bad enough when it came to exaggerating designs. And I was determined that if I couldn't get any more weight on the front, I'd take some off the back. <laughs> well, the back suspension and structure of a car chassis is in many ways designed to take the twisting torque of the rear brakes when you put them on, because the twisting power is fairly considerable. Well, I thought if I left the back brakes off, we would lighten the back, so I did. Well, the next thing that I seemed to think was a bit superfluous was, after all, the rear of a chassis of a car in those days flexed about a bit. So why have an extra flexibility by building in a rear suspension? Why not just put the wheels on the corner of the chassis and have no suspension? <laughs> Which I did. <laughs> so I saved weight again. Well, there was a reasonably good idea embodied in an exaggerated manner. I was so pleased with myself, I'd gone to town. And, unfortunately, I had to go to Belfast to uh, um, take part in a hill climb there on the outskirts of Belfast. And the car was finished just in time to put it onto uh, a wee cargo boat that charged the cheapest amount for tonnage to go over to Belfast and be taken off by a crane at the harbour there. The engine had never been started and I'd never driven the car. I hadn't had a chance to, I was working just up to the last moment. Well now the first problem was this, that I had to get this device through the RAC official scrutiny that took place in the morning uh, in the pits. And they looked at that device <laughs> and it worried them a good deal. They said, please, could they see how it worked and whether I got any brakes on it? Well, now, I had got one brake on it. I, I got a transmission brake built in there. Now, the road was wet, soaking wet. And there's an interesting phenomena about having a transmission brake. And that is this, that the force comes out and is separated by the differential equally. And therefore, if one wheel is in a puddle and the other is not in a puddle, the wheel in the puddle will, spill, will spin round backwards, while this one goes forwards. <laughs> I tried this out on the officials. Mind you, the brake wasn't good. It needed a hurry change into reverse to get it to lock up. They didn't notice that. <laughs> See a car happy, happily going along about 60 miles an hour and then apparently the wheels starting go, turning round in the other direction. So fascinated them, they forgot there weren't any back brakes on it. They didn't even look. Well, they got through the scrutineering. The next thing was to bring it up to the starting line and actually motor off in it. Car had never been driven up a hill, I'd never driven up in pouring rain. 
Well, I'd only been going about 10 seconds when I discovered that it was not a good idea to over-design things. <laughs> and uh, I believe when we finally went over the finishing line, there was some controversy whether the back wheels or the front wheels went over it first. <laughs> The proceedings were then stopped while the RAC met in solemn conclave. And their verdict of the loudspeakers was that I was banned from any more driving that day or far as they knew that car would never be allowed to be driven in Ireland again. I protested strongly as I was second fastest and was going to just try and speed things up next time. But they wouldn't take any notice of it. I don't blame them. The whole thing was totally over-designed. It was exaggerated. My emotional enthusiasm over my own ideas had pretty well killed, anyway, for the Republic of Ireland, what was essentially, I feel, quite a good idea. Now, the next thing about a sense of style is this that it often commends itself to you if you see that someone has taken a shortcut by borrowing from another industry the solution to his own problem. This is something where you need a sort of imaginative idea of transferring across and discovering whether your particular problem is in actual fact a problem that has already been solved in another and possibly quite uh, a different industry altogether. For instance, some short time ago I <clears throat> went to a factory where they were making needle loom carpets. And this involved thousands of needles going up and down at a tremendously high speed, all driven um, by eccentrics. And everything was going so fast it was a complete blur and you couldn't see how anything was designed or any of the mechanism. But when they stopped the machine, I found that each set of needle was operated by a connecting rod and a bearing of an eccentric. And these connecting rods and bearings were, were standard Ford components. They were just buying them by the thousands from Ford. Beautifully designed, very cheap, made to a high precision, spare parts readily available. They had merely borrowed from one industry the solution to the problem they needed in another industry. I remember once seeing a draftsman toying away, working out a, a reasonably complicated hydraulic system. And I happened to spot more by luck than judgment that what the circuit, the hydraulic circuit that he was actually using was almost identical to a complicated form of forklift truck which is on the market. So I said, stop doing that and go to the spare parts of so-and-so forklift truck people and you can buy what you want over the counter. That is what I regard as good economical engineering style. You must take across frontier components, but here is a, a warning note you must never drag complete machines across frontiers. Many people have said to themselves, I'll take that machine which does what it's designed to do there and holus bolus, I'll put it in another context and I'm sure it'll be all right there. It never does and you must never do it. The distinction is of a vital importance. I was once asked to represent a company to examine a new invention. I, I had done this quite often, it's always embarrassing. And this, but I had to go up to Manchester and this new invention was reputed to mix things together. 
Now the companies I were representing were making linoleum, which requires mixing together a whole lot of highly unmixable ingredients, linseed oil, whiting like this, wood flour, pigments, all sorts of things. And the mixing of them together is very difficult. And the machine that I was reputed to examine, I discovered was designed like this. Up in the air was a 200 horsepower motor. Here was an input chute, this is very diagrammatical. Down here was the main mixing machine. Out here was where the, the mixture fell down into trays. I had a look at the machine and I had a word with the inventor. The inventor was poor man, terribly nervous, especially of two gentlemen in dark city suits who put up the money and he was obviously terrified of them. Well, I, I had a look at this machine I said to him, look here, you haven't designed a mixer, have you? You have designed a disintegrator. And he said, yes, actually it is. But I've been told, <laughs> scary look at these gentlemen, there's a much bigger market for mixers and I thought if it was going to tear things up, it might tear lots of things up together and mix them up while they were doing it. And so this officially is a mixer. So I said, oh, I see. Well, that sent down various loyfuls of, of barrels of material. And into the top here for the first test, they put linseed oil and whiting and wood dust, in it went there. And we all stood round here to see how it would come out nicely mixed together or otherwise. There really was and nothing came out. <laughs> the machine hummed happily to itself, <laughs> otherwise nothing happened. Nothing went through at all. And after about five minutes, the nervous inventor said, well, uh, I, I think it needs a little bit of help. Will you excuse me a moment? And he rushed out of the factory building and then came back with a large sack of wood shavings. And he climbed up the ladder here and put in a sack of wood shavings. Well, the machine let out a sort of disgruntled squeak. And then went on humming to itself and nothing came out of the bottom here. <laughs> well, by this time, everyone was getting embarrassed and the machine was getting hot. And it was starting to smell. And my chemistry wasn't very good, but I didn't know what would happen if linseed oil and wood shavings and one thing and another started to get too hot. So I said to the inventor, what are you going to do now? Oh, he said, I'll clear that out, no trouble at all, and rushed out of the factory, jumped into his car and disappeared. <laughs> Came back again with two sacks. I said, what have you got in there? He said, household coke. So he climbed up his ladder and he put two large sacks of household coke into that machine and it let out a howl of fury. <laughs> All the instruments went off the dial, it jumped about on its bottom there, it howled with rage, it shook. For about 30 seconds there was pandemonium, <laughs> and then it settled down to humming to itself <laughs> once again, and nothing ever came out here. <laughs> well, by this time the smell and the heat, and the, it was really getting quite lethal. Um, so I went for a little walk round the factory while the inventor rushed out muttering to himself and got into his car again. <laughs> he, he came back again and asked me to help him out with a sack. <laughs> I said, what have you got this time? Ah, he said, I've got something that'll shake it. 
lead shots. <laughs> I helped him up the ladder, pushing and pulling with a sack of lead shot, and we poured it in there. And five seconds afterwards, the machine split vertically down <laughs> like that, and an absolute flood of linseed, oil, household coke, lead shavings, whiting, and sawdust came across the factory floor like a Holly got black mass of liquid, and we were treated in front of it. And the poor inventor, I daren't look at him. He had tried to import across a frontier an idea that was incompatible with a new industry. It is good engineering style to import the components, but never import the actual principle itself. It always, in practice, needs modifying. Why in theory that we show, I don't know. But in actual fact, that always happens. Now, I must turn to the second filter. And this is a more conscious filter. The filter that you learn to develop here. And that is that all machines work exactly according to the mathematical analysis of their content and their context. Every machine would pass any exam, 100% marks in its own subject. Theory is practice. And in learning about theory, you don't walk one step away from reality, you walk one step towards it. Now, the difficulty about this is that it doesn't feel like it. Imagine, for instance, after a supervision, you are bicycling home tonight in the dark. What seems real is the handlebars in front of you, or the rain that's hitting your face, or the rust, or the cold, or all the real things of life that are impinging on you. And if you look up into the, into the night sky and happen to observe the stars, it might not be likely, but you might remember that that is the realm of general relativity, curved space and unimaginable distances, completely unreal compared with the bouncing handlebars um, of your bicycle. And then possibly, looking at those handlebars, if you had a background in physics, and you'd remember that those handlebars were really d dominated by quantum mechanics, the, uh, the, un the lawless movement of indefinable energy, the unimaginable world of quantum mechanics with what you were looking at, and you say, that's all phony, I'm looking at something hard and rusty, and cold. You see, above you was unreality, below you in scale was unreality, you were dealing with the real thing. But an observer outside this world, what would he see? He would see the world of Einstein, the big scale world. He had seen the world of quantum mechanics, he would see that they actually touched and overlapped in a wafer-thin scale, an unreal, a special case, if you like, a little level where humanity lives. The great reality of relationships and the great realities of, mm, of quantities actually overlap in the scale in which we live. We are the freaks. We are the special case. We are the unreal world. No, we are the no man's land where all, where all man live. We can go up if we like with Einstein into relativity and get giddy or go down into potholing with Eddington and get lost. But we have to live and move and have our beating and design on that wafer-thin interconnection of quantities and relationships. 
And that's how everything material works. And therefore, arithmetic and algebra is the nearest thing that you can get to the nature of things. Differential equations are a step into reality, not away from it. And what you are building here, I hope, is a mathematical filter which will logically eliminate all those designs which are unrealistic. And because you're teaching precisely because it is all mathematical, is precisely more real, more dependable and more lasting than all the emotional ideas that you can pretend for a short time as being more important. Now let me give one or two examples of that. You see, we're so inclined uh, to design emotionally and not analytically. There was a film producer, for instance, who had a marvellous invention. And he worked out, and this was a basis of invention. He was very good at making Western films, and he worked out how to make the shooting of glasses The shooting of glasses on a, on a bar, when the baby comes in and shoots all the glasses off, you know, to make the glasses explode in a realistic manner. If the glass is empty, it just collapses flat, you see, isn't any good for the film. But he discovered that if you take a glass and fill it right up to the brim with water, it still looks transparent, what happens is that the bullet goes into the glass makes a hole in the glass there, but if it's full up with water, the forces then go off in every direction. The displacement of the water by the bullet produces forces in every possible direction, and the glass explodes. And the baddie comes in and all the glasses explode, and that's what you see on westerns. Well, now, he thought that he, he could utilize this principle very effectively in solving which is sometimes a difficult problem. And that was this. You have these very large chimneys, brick chimneys. <laughs> he said to himself, that's a nice big glass, isn't it? Why have all the problem of putting in explosives of various calculated places so that the thing falls down when you want to get rid of it. The thing to do is this, is to fill it up with water just there. Which they did. They put in a meter of water and an explosive charge there. This was about a vast one, 300 feet high or something like that. And exploded it. And what do you think happened? It's your guess mutterings. Uh-huh. It got wet, yes, it did get wet. <laughs> it obeyed exactly the theory, the principle, the mathematics. And so what happened? Take quite literally the math, yeah? What mathematics says that this will shear off here. It sheared off dead flat like that and the chimney fell down there and perched on the dead flat foundation. <laughs> <laughs> and no one quite wanted to go near it to give it a wee push. It had obeyed the mathematical principles involved. And you must learn to have this sort of filter in your mind that blocks your emotional visions of how you think a new invention is going to work. You must filter it out against the mathematical analysis of its context and its content. Perhaps I've just got time for another illustration of that. And it also concerns uh, my highly 
unfortunately it passed when I was a student here because uh, the particular car that got banned off of Belfast I thought to make an ideal rally car um, provided that um, I put a few more brakes on the back well I licensed it and drove it on the road for a bit and it was extremely interesting but I thought I ought to put some brakes on the back there and I said to myself well by and large in rallies which means going fast up twisty hills with rotten surfaces it'd be a good idea if I could lock up the back wheel solid uh, because that might get the back to skid around a bit on occasions so I bought the biggest brakes I could I cut off the chassis th there and I put on a new back to the chassis had a seat here had the chassis member coming under the seat and then I had some quarter elliptic springs coming here I've taken off this back wheel, we've got the other back wheel that side, but so you can see in. Here is the back axle with no drive in it, of course, because the drive is off the front. And then I put on a huge brake drum here off a racing Bugatti car, the biggest I could buy. Because I got quite a thing about having some brakes now. And that was operated by a lever. And there was a cable here up to a huge forged steel brake handle there and I said to myself if I get into trouble all I've got to do is to haul on there that'll pull on the cable that'll put the Grand Prix brakes on and anyway I shall be able to stop well as usual I'd only just finished the car a few hours before the rally was due to start at, at uh, Virginia Water in London. I hadn't had any time to put electrical equipment on it. I got no self-starter and naturally no lights. So I hurriedly bought six bicycle lamps which I put round the front. And um, it was um, starting at seven o'clock at night. I knew it was soon going to be dark. And the first hill we had to climb in the dark anyway. However, I got to the start. I lit up all my little bicycle lamps and away I went. Due to the vibration or other matters, um, all the six lamps soon fell off. <laughs> However, the, I found a solution to that. It was following other competitors about. You see, they made them nervous after a bit because they could hear me but not see me in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and um, having gone up one time trial without any lights at all we were going along at about <coughs> three o'clock in the morning in Somerset and I'd just been following behind a gentleman who had spent ten miles in shaking me off and finally succeeded and so I was driving along a concrete road by the light of a moon and then we were going reasonably fast and lining ourselves up for um, a right hand bend as far as I could see by the light of the moon when a cloud came along, the moon disappeared. So I hurriedly reached over and clawed hold of my safety device there, which worked only too well. Both back wheels locked solid. A fraction of a second after, the flimsy little torque reaction member here broke. And that meant that the back brakes started to twist the back axle around. That naturally wound in this cable round there. <laughs> and that had most interesting results. Because the force on that cable was so much that this handbrake shot over, missed its top, and went straight into the road. <laughs> and the back of the car went up in the air in clouds of sparks and I started ploughing up the road at high speed <laughs> until I disappeared through a hedge and started ploughing up Somerset. <laughs> uh, the moral to that disreputable story is precisely this that I designed emotionally and not analytically 
If I'd had the sense to wait and try and push that through an analytical filter, I would have spotted that this sustaining torque arm here was ridiculously fragile. It didn't look it. All I was concentrating on was one to whoop in an emergency. And always remember that the reality of material things are dominated by relationships and magnitudes. Differential equations are the most practical things in the world. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>